You ever had a time in your life where the fear of something was so overwhelming you couldn't stand to be by yourself? You just wanted somebody else there? You kind of feel like, uh, I'm all alone, and if you leave, it's going to get worse. Maybe as as a child when it's bedtime, and bedtime's bad enough, right? Because you turn the lights off, and who knows what comes out from under the bed. Unless there's so much junk under the bed, there's no room for anything else under there. But maybe there's a storm outside and the lightning and thunder frightened you as a kid and and mom or dad came to tuck you in at night and and they turned to walk out the door and and you said to them, please don't leave me. You can't go away right now. Of course, there are times as your children grow up a few years where you kind of flip the scripts, right, mom? And you're begging your children to go away. Right, please get out of here. Leave me alone for a little while. In, in fact, if you'll leave, I'll even let you play in the street. <laughs> right, you, you, there's those times where we want people with us. And, and, and the fear that comes from not having, we're, we're, we're scared we're going to be by ourselves. But that's generally not the way we approach church, is it? Most churches have the goal, we don't want people to leave us. We want people to to come to us. We want them, and, and, and we're begging people, please don't go away. And yet when we come to the bread of life discourse that we've read in John 6, and we've talked about the last three weeks, really four weeks from the beginning of John 6, we find this really interesting and odd and, and really, I guess, anti-church growth mentality of Jesus. Because Jesus breaks off this teaching in John chapter 6, And it results not in the crowd getting bigger, but in the crowd getting smaller. Jesus comes with some teaching that pins right into the heart of these people and pokes them just in a way that says, I don't want to be a part of this. I can't do that. I can't believe that. I can't accept that. And and as we come to the end of this, the passage we read just a moment ago, we see Jesus turning to his disciples, the 12, and saying, are you also going to go away? And in some sense, if you didn't read this carefully, it would almost be like that child snuggled up under the covers who's scared to death turning to mom and their dad and saying, you're not going to go away, are you? That storm outside is, is too strong. It's too loud. You're not going to leave, are you? And, and here's the thing. That's not Jesus. Jesus isn't asking that question at the end, will you also go away? Jesus isn't asking that like a scared toddler. He's not asking that like, like a jilted lover who is watching the love of their life walk out the door. He's asking as the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. He's asking as one who already knows the answer. He's asking as one who knows that there are 12 men in front of him who need to answer the question, not for him, but for themselves. He's asking a question for the ages. It's a question that comes down to to us today because every single one of us, and I say every single one of us, including me, has to answer this question. When it comes to the hard words of Jesus, will you also go away? Are you ready to abandon Jesus because the words that he speaks run contrary to what we want to hear and to what we want to believe? Now, now let's review just briefly to set the stage and remind us what is happening as we, as we go back to the beginning of John 6, and it was four weeks ago, but probably in Jesus' life in John 6, it was just yesterday, um, this is the conclusion. And, and we've been, this will be the fourth message on it, and it probably all should have been one message, uh, but because of the sake of time and our attention spans, I decided to stretch it out a little bit. But, but here's what happened. In, in John chapter 6, there's, there's all these people gathered listening to Jesus, and night comes and there's no food, and, and remember the story how Jesus takes five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000 people, plus the women and children, as, as the other gospels tell us. Maybe fifteen or 20,000 people, and that was an amazing thing. But Jesus knew what was in their heart. Jesus said, man, these people having seen this, they're going to want to take me now, and they're going to want to make me the king, and, and this isn't the time for that. So Jesus kind of slips off into the darkness, the falling dusk probably, and, and 
And then the disciples, the 12, they're left. They got their 12 baskets of food there. And they look around for Jesus, and he's gone. And, and I kind of imagine maybe the 12 disciples says, when Jesus was here, he could handle the crowd. We're not equipped for that. And so the disciples slip off in a boat, and they're going to head back across the Sea of Galilee. And while they're out there in the darkness, a storm blows up. And then they look up and see Jesus coming to them and calming the storm. And then the next day, the crowd goes searching for Jesus. And they can't find him, and they're looking all over, and finally they find him. And in John chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus says, You seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, now when he says, not because you saw signs, he didn't mean they didn't see the miracle. They did see the miracle. They knew exactly what he did. When he says you didn't see the signs, he's saying you didn't see it as a sign. You didn't come because you recognized what the sign was about. You're searching me because you're, you're looking for me because you had a meal and you want another one. And Jesus begins to confront them about what was going on. Here was Jesus teaching, you want food, but what you need is me. They say, well, we have Moses who gave our fathers bread in the wilderness. Are you greater than he is? And Jesus says, yes, I am. I'm not the one, the leader of Israel in the wilderness, who begged God and prayed for God to send bread down. I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And you have to come to me for eternal life. And all that the Father gives to me will come, and I will raise him up at the last day. And, and no one can come unless the Father draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have to totally believe. You have to be totally committed to me. You can't halfway eat. Remember that from last week? You can't halfway eat something. You can taste it and spit it out, but you can't kind of eat it. You either eat it or you don't. That's why Jesus was saying it was, a, it was something there to be a total commitment. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I will raise him up at the last day. These are tough words. They were tough for people to hear back then, and, and they're tough for us to hear now. In fact, for many of you, when you read John 6, you're troubled by it. And this passage is so stark and, and difficult. And it's not difficult because the words are hard to understand, right? The words are pretty easy. What's hard to understand is why is it that God works this way? And, and I know that some, you know, you find it hard to understand because I've talked to many of you about it and we've, we've discussed it and I, and I love that. And, and some of you wonder, why, why would you preach this? Um, to be honest, this is a passage that doesn't find its way into many books on church growth and how to get your church bigger by next week. It, ju it just doesn't show up there. It's, it's not the keynote passages from conferences. In fact, there's not much reason at all to preach this message this morning unless you're committed to preaching all the way through John 6 and all the way through the book of John, and it would look really odd to skip it, right? Remember, that's the way I typically preach here. We go with chapter 1, verse 1, and we just start working our way through, and then when we get to the end, we stop and go on to another book, right? And, and so we started back in January in John chapter 1, verse 1, and, and, and we've taken a couple breaks along the way, but our primary commitment has been we're always coming back to John, and we're going to take the next thing in the book. So it would have looked odd if I'd preached John 1 through 5 and then skipped to 7. Yeah, well, what happened to 6? I can't really do that. And so we have to deal with John chapter 6. And, and so what we've tried to do is dive into this over the last few weeks and try to understand what it is that Jesus says. Now, now I say it that way in particular. We're not trying to understand what we already believe. Okay, We're trying to understand what Jesus actually said and try to understand what he intended people to understand by it. The reality is that the teaching by Christ about Christ and about us is troubling, and it does drive some people away. His, his teaching is hard. Look now at John chapter 6, verse number 60. Many of his disciples, the word disciples is used a bunch of different ways in the gospel. Sometimes it's used of the 12, the 12 disciples, right? There were the, the, those who were closest to Jesus. But sometimes disciples had a, had a more generic meaning, just mean followers. Now, now today we have followers of somebody, you know, you might, 
in these days, you know, you might watch them on YouTube or listen to them on the radio and try to implement their principles in your life. Back in the ancient time, before you had all that technology, you know what you did when you were a follower? You actually followed them. Like when he went to Capernaum, you went to Capernaum because that's where he was. And when, when he went to Jerusalem, you went to Jerusalem because that's where he was. You actually followed him around. And, and that's what this means. There's this group of disciples, and, and, and they say this is a hard saying. This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And by that, they weren't talking about what you're doing right now, right? They're, who can understand and grasp this? Who can really hang on to this? Who can really understand? Who can accept this? Jesus was conscious that his disciples grumbled at this. So he says to him, does this cause you to stumble? You having a, you having a hard time with this? Now, Jesus knew that. How did Jesus know that? Well, on the one hand, Jesus knows everything because he's God. On the other hand, because Jesus knows his teaching, every teacher knows when you sit down with a class that there are some things that are going to be hard to understand. And if you've taught the class more than once, you probably know which lecture it's going to be that's hard for them to understand. Jesus knew that. Does this cause you to stumble? And here's what Jesus does in verse number 60, 61, 62, sorry. He pushes them just a little bit farther. You think it's bad now? You think this is hard? What would you do when you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Notice how Jesus is not content just to let them sit right there. Let me push you a step farther. What happens when you see the ascension? Now, why would that have been troubling? Well, it could have been troubling because if you're going to ascend, that means you first have to descend. And Jesus knew that before that ascension, he was going to suffer and die. You think it's hard to believe in me when I'm alive and standing in front of you and teaching you? What are you going to do when I'm dead? We've read the end of the story. We know what they did, right? They all disappeared into the night. But not only that, what are you going to do when you see me go back up into heaven? You see, you didn't think I came from heaven to begin with. You thought that was blasphemy. What's your response going to, see, going to be when you see me go back? You see, Jesus was not content to let people rest in a comfortable belief. Jesus was not content to, have, to be surrounded by, to have a large crowd of people who were comfortable with believing things that were not enough to believe. Jesus wanted to push them. Jesus wanted to give them some hard words. What were these hard words? Look back at John chapter 6, verse number 15. Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew. Jesus was telling him, listen, I'm not your earthly king right now. You see, these were the Jews who had been living under Roman domination. They wanted a king. They were, they were dying for this Old Testament promise, this Messiah who's going to come and throw off all their captors and reestablish the kingdom and, and rain God's blessings back down on them. This is him. He just fed 5,000 people. This has got to be the guy. And Jesus said, no, not now. What do you mean you're not the guy? You're doing everything the guy is supposed to do. We, we've read this. We, we've started. You got no, not now. In, in fact, he says to them, verse number 27, verse number 26, you, you seek me not because you saw signs, you had loaves and, and were filled, you had a meal. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. He, he says to him, it's, you're, you're seeking the wrong thing. You're seeking the wrong thing. He challenged you, what you came looking for? You're totally misguided. Again, probably not high on the list of ways to make friends and influence people, right? Tell them, hey, you're all wrong. You totally missed the boat. He says to them, you have to come to me. This is the work of God, verse 29. You believe in him who he sent. You got to believe in me. You have to come to me. You're not greater than Moses, are you? I am greater than Moses. But you've got to come. And everyone that the Father gives me will come. And no one can come unless the Father draws him, unless the Father gives it to him. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everybody listening to him says, whoa, back up the truck. I'm not ready for that. You, you, you 
Surely we misunderstood. But here's what's interesting about Jesus. When he knows what's going on in the mind, they ask him questions and he pushes them farther. And then they start to grumble and start to kind of murmur among themselves, say, well, what is this stuff this guy's talking about? What does Jesus do? He doesn't back off and say, no, 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 you, you misunderstood. I, I didn't actually mean like eat. I just meant like kind of try it out. I, no, Jesus does not back off one iota. Jesus doesn't try to clarify. Jesus doesn't try to beg them to stay around. Why would he say this? And in asking that question, we're really asking two questions. Not just why would Jesus say this, but why should we say this? Why should we say this? Well, we say it because it's true. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. When Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, when Jesus says, if you're going to have eternal life, you're going to get it through me, there is no other way. Jesus said it because it's true. The only way to eternal life is to stop believing things that aren't true and start believing things that are true. Some of you right now have built your whole life on a house of cards. And it hasn't fallen yet. But you have committed your way of life to a belief system that isn't true. And Jesus is speaking into that. The unfortunate path of too many today is we aren't telling the people the truth about who they are and who Jesus is. You know why? Because it's hard. Most of us don't want to offend people. I know some of you want to, right? At times, I, I, I have that side in me too. I try to, I try to keep it private. And I do try to repent of it and not, not live that. But listen, there are times I want to, I just want to, I just want to poke people. Um, one, one guy, Vody Bacham, says that the greatest sin is the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice. We want to be so nice to people. And, and you know what Jesus does? Jesus is willing to go after people and say, you know what, you're believing something that isn't true about yourself. You're believing something isn't true about me. You see, we, we present ourselves as mostly good people who need a little push over the edge. Many, you know, I don't be careful here, but, but, I, but I just want to challenge us to think about this in light of what Jesus is saying because so much of, of church, so much of religion today is telling people, listen, you're basically good. You, you're a good part. You mean well. You've got all kinds of good intentions and, and, and you fall a little bit short. And you know what the beautiful thing about Jesus is? He makes up everything you lack. And, and there's this sense in which we have, we come in, and Jesus does make up everything we lack. Here's the problem with the message is that we haven't actually gotten to the reality of what people lack. And what people lack is, is everything. Everything. You see, we are sinners who are far from God. We are sinners who have sinned against God, and we didn't just do it one time. We did it a bunch of times. And, and, and we don't just do it one day, we do it a bunch of days. And we keep doing it. And I've said this before, um, and I stole it from somebody else. You are far worse than you could ever dare to imagine. You are far worse than you could ever dare to imagine. And, and some of you this morning, you're sitting there saying, I can't believe I came to church. I got up early this morning. I rolled out of bed at 10.30 to make it here by 11. And you're going to tell me I'm far, far worse than I could ever imagine? But, but here's the good news of it. In Christ, you are far more loved and accepted than you could ever dare to hope. You see, that's the good news of the gospel. And you know what Jesus came to do? He came to die for sinners. But he didn't come to die for righteous people. Not because there aren't righteous people. There aren't. But there are some people who think they're just a little bit too good. They're up here, and, and Jesus is kind of the, the guy who pushes us over the edge. And I want to tell you, when Jesus was speaking to these people, he went right after the heart of their belief. You think you can do enough works to get to God. That's what they asked. What are the works we can do to please God? Jesus says, the only work is to believe me. Jesus said this because it's true. Jesus said this because it is the pathway to eternal life. Why do we say it? Well, because Jesus said it. 
and I got nothing better. And I don't need anything better because the hope of eternal life is bound up in the message of Jesus. We say it because God is at work in it. Look down at verse number uh, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. That's what you need. You need life. It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. This, this earthly, fleshly existence, everything you can do on this earth, you know what will get you? Life on this earth. That's what will get you. And you know what that's worth? Not much. It profits nothing in terms of eternal. It is the words that I have spoken to you. These are spirit and these are life. You see, God is at work in this. Remember, it says no one can come unless the Father draws him. How does the Father draw people to himself? And the answer is through the preaching of the Word of God. When the message of Jesus is held up and Jesus is proclaimed to be the way of eternal life, God is at work in this. And I don't have a good explanation for how that works. Sometimes the old gospel song, I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin. I I don't know how it works. But it is the words that Jesus spoke. This is what gives life. And as we read this this morning, I hope our faith is challenged. Some of you, you've heard this, and and you're going to hear some more in the next few minutes or so. And, and you're going to be like, man, I, I got a hard time with that. I can't believe that. I, I, have a, I can't go to a church that teaches that. And I remind you, Jesus didn't try to change it. Jesus didn't try to clarify any misunderstandings. Jesus pushed ahead with it. And Jesus says this and just lets it hang there. And when people walked away, you know what Jesus did? Nothing. He let them walk away. Reminded of the story of the rich young ruler came, Jesus, what, what shall I do to have eternal life? Jesus says, keep the commandments. Oh, I've done all that. Go and sell all you have. And, and the man went away sorrowing because he had great possessions. And, and Jesus ran after him and said, no, no, no. <laughs> he misunderstood. I didn't really mean sell everything you had. Come back. Let me try again. He did no such thing. Jesus presented the message, these hard words of Jesus, He just said, this is the way it is. Verse number 65, verse number 64, he said, there are some of you who do not believe. Every Sunday when I stand up here and preach, I look out and I know there are some of you who do not believe. I don't know who you are, for the most part. But I know there's some of you who don't believe. And Jesus said this crowd, there, there, are, there are some of you who don't believe in Because Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe him and who it was that would betray him. Jesus knew exactly who was in front of him. And he said, for this reason, I said that no one can come unless it has been granted him from the Father. Now, now let me point out again the similarity. Look back at chapter uh, 6, verse 44. No one can come unless the Father who sent me draws him. See that? In verse number 65, no one can come unless it has been granted him by the Father. See that? The drawing and the granting are the same thing. All right, right? You see that? All right, both of them are connected. You cannot come unless this happens to you. Now look at verse number 37. All that the Father, what? gives me, will come. That word gives is the same word as verse number 65, granted. It's translated a little bit differently in some of our English translations, but it's the exact same word. Jesus said, everybody that the Father gives will come, and no one can come unless they have been given. And that giving is the drawing. You see that? Okay, I want you to see it in the text. I want you to see this is what Jesus said. Now, now, now here's, here's the thing, you know, when we read this, like, well, wait a second, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm on board with that. I think that's a little harsh, right? And I'm going to say, read the text. What does God say? This is how it works, and you have to accept this. And Jesus looked at the, out the crowd in front of him and said, some of you don't. And some of you don't because... The Father hasn't given it to you. 
This speaks to how we do ministry as a church, as followers of Jesus. There's a one author who says anyone can be one to Christ if you find the key to his or her heart. And so many are spending their lives looking for the keys to people's hearts. As if we can do something, find the particular thing that interests them. And, and here's what Jesus says, you can't come unless the Father draws you. And when the Father draws you, you will come. This is the way it works. And, and the question for us is, is the simple and clear reliance on the Scripture's contents and the Scripture's method, is that enough for us or do we need something else? I fear today many are infatuated with methodology. If we just find a better way to build a better mousetrap. And, and I'm for innovating our methods, okay? I don't have a problem with, with, with some of that. Here's what I have a problem with, is that when we abandon the clear, explicit teaching of the gospel and calling people not to believe in a better version of themselves and pursue a better version of themselves, but to recognize that apart from Christ, we are hopelessly lost, and in Christ we can be eternally saved. That is the message of the gospel. For many, theology is secondary. If I was going through the Bible picking out some kind of topics to preach on, to attract people, this probably wouldn't be on the list. But again, it's John 6, and if I skip from 5 to 7, it's going to look really weird. And Some of you are going to ask me about it. I'm going to have to explain it to you anyway. So I might as well just explain it to us all together, right? This is what it says. Here's the question for us. Are we willing, are you willing to drive people away with this teaching? Jesus was. Jesus was. You say, well, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better if we discuss this on Wednesday night or Sunday night when far fewer people would hear it? Did you know we meet Sunday nights and Wednesday nights? <laughs> but that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't preserve this for a smaller crowd. Listen, it's not my message. When I stand up and preach, I try desperately hard to show you this is the message of Jesus. And I ask you to open your Bibles and look at the words on the page because I want you to see it's in the text. Is this foolish? Yeah. Is it ridiculous to try to persuade people to come by telling them how bad they are and how hopeless they are? Yeah, it is. I understand that. Can't, can't, can't you be a little more creative, Pastor? Can't you? I got no creativity. Can't you be a little more interesting? Probably. I was talking to somebody this week about how not to be boring in preaching. I obviously haven't perfected that yet, I know. All right, but, but here's the thing is, I want to be interesting. I do want to persuade people. But all the preaching in the world is vain unless the Father is at work. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 likens it to blindness that the God of this world has blinded their minds so that they might not see. The God who caused light to shine out of darkness is the one who is shown in your hearts. That's the prayer. That's the hope. What was Jesus saying? Listen, I can give you all the great messages and the beautiful illustrations, but unless the Father draws you, you're not coming. It's not going to happen. How bright does the light have to be for a blind person to see? It doesn't matter, does it? You say, Pastor, if you believe all that, why do you preach? And my answer is, I preach because I believe it. If I sat in my study all week long and thought, I've got to come up with something fascinating enough and convincing enough to convince these people to come to Jesus, I'd go get another job. I'd go do something else. Um, be because I think it's totally hopeless. I spent my life trying to convince people for this and that and the other thing. I used to work in retail sales, got paid on commission. I know what it's like to try to convince people. 
And, and you, know what, you know what? If I did not believe that God was at work in you right now, I would have no hope. But I preach because I believe God's at work. I believe God's doing something in you. And some of you this morning, you're hearing this message for the first time, and, and you're going to take, and you need to take that, that absurd step of crossing over and saying, Jesus, I got nothing except you. Say, why is that absurd? And it's absurd because you are giving all up, up all human effort. You are willing to say, God, I got nothing. My best efforts are nothing. I'm coming to Jesus because he's enough for you. And you know what can convince you of that? The Spirit of God working through the Word of God. That's what does. And some of you are here this morning. You're hearing this message. You know what you need to do? You need to take the step and come to Jesus. You need to st take the step and believe that Jesus is the only way for you to be saved. That's why he died on the cross, because the wages of sin is death. And it's either your death or his death. Pick one. The good news is by faith, it can be his death. Because of this, verse 66, after this, after this teaching, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. That, that big crowd of people who came for a meal, they left. And Jesus turns to the twelve and he asks the question we started with. Are you going to go away? Is this too much for you? And he asks that same question to us today. Are you going to go away? Are you going to walk away? Is this too much for you? Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else could we get this? We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That phrase, the Holy One of God, do you know that's only used one other place in the Gospels? It's in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus is casting out a demon. You know who says it? The demon. The demon recognizes the divine authority of Jesus. So Peter and demons have something in common. Do you? <laughs> Do you believe that Jesus is the Holy One from God? He has this divine nature, this status that puts him above all humanity because he is God. He's not a superhuman. He is the bread of God come down out of heaven. And one day he's going to ascend back up into heaven because that's where he came from. You're the Holy One of God. Where else would we go? And I ask you the question today, if you want eternal life, if you want to be a part of God's family, where else are you going to go? Can you imagine trying to get to heaven on your own? Some of you have imagined that. Some of you spent your life working for it, thinking, I'd be better, I'll do better. And at the end, I hope, I hope it's enough. I don't want to encourage you this morning because that will never be enough. But Jesus is enough. Jesus is the one who has the words of eternal life. Is that going to drive you away? What is it that would drive you away from Jesus? What would Jesus ask of you that is too much? I mean, some of you read John and say, Oh, I agree with every word of that. Bless God. I'm on board. But what happens when you get to some other passages of Scripture where all of a sudden, I'm not quite so sure I'm in with that one. Maybe it's about some of the other things Jesus is calling you to obedience and submission in. Maybe you read some of the epistles or you read something else in, in the Proverbs. or something. You read enough section of Scripture, like, whoa, whoa, wait, Jesus. <laughs> I want a Savior, not a king. Jesus, I, I can't give that. I'm not quite ready to go that far. And Will you also go away? Is the teaching of Jesus too much? You see, when I say teaching of Jesus, I don't mean just the red letters in your Bible. Remember, all Scripture is God-breathed. Jesus is God. It is all His Word. He calls us to obedience in His church, to, to obedience and live in submission to Him. And, and what's too much for Him to ask of you? Jesus says, I, I chose you 12, didn't I? And one of you is the devil. Can you imagine being a part of that? You're like 12, and one of you is a devil. 
And you know what every single disciple did there? I don't either because it doesn't say. But here's what I know they didn't do. Nobody said, God be Judas. You see him sleeping during that message? For those of you who just woke up. Nobody said, it's got to be Jesus. It's got to be Judas. I think there was some confusion here. At the Last Supper, when Jesus is gathered by in that upper room with his disciples, and he says to him, one of you is going to betray me, what did they say? Is it I? Is it I? I think right here there was a, whoa, wait a second. Is it I? Maybe, maybe there's a little bit of anger on the part of some of them. One of us, one of our groups, going to betray you? Oh, let, tell us who. We'll get them. I don't know what it was, but here's, here's what I want you to hear. A second question. Are you a devil? Are you one of those for whom submission to Jesus is too much? You see, that's what it was for Judas. He turned against him. He turned against him. He was not willing to live. But you know what? Judas looked just like the others did. Nobody knew it was him. Not until the end. I ask you the question this morning, will you go away? And if you do, where are you going to go? Are you going to betray Jesus? The Bible tells us in John 13 that during the supper, that last supper, the devil having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. The devil. In John 13, 27, after the morsel, Satan entered him. And Jesus said, what you do, do it quickly. Get out of here. Go. See, John's calling us to make a decision. You cannot stand on the fence about who Jesus is. He calls us for self-examination. Will you go away? And if you do, where are you going to go? Where is it? Who else is going to offer you the forgiveness of sins, the eternal life that I'm offering you? Where else do you go? You, you, you're stumbling a little bit over this idea that, that God has to be at work, that, that no one can come unless the Father draws him and that all the Father gives will come. Is that, is that a stumbling block for you? And, and I can acknowledge that, that it's hard to understand. I know it's hard to understand. You think it's hard to understand? Y'all try explaining it. But I ask you, what does the text say? These are the words of Jesus. What do we do with them? Well, I think Jesus kind of got that one wrong. I don't think he did. I think what he was pointing out is that God is at work drawing people to himself. I don't know who that is. They say, well, well what about the people who aren't drawn? What about them? What about them? I think some of us have this idea that, that this gospel and salvation is, is, is kind of like people pounding on the door, begging God to save them. And, and God said, no, 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 I didn't draw you. <laughs> You're not in. You know what? The people who don't come, they won't come. They don't want to come. You know what Judas did? Judas did exactly what he wanted to do. Judas did exactly what... Nobody forced Judas to do that. Judas did exactly what he wanted to do. Every single person who walks away from Jesus, every single person who doesn't trust in Jesus, does so because they will not trust. And yes, the Father's at work in that. And no, I can't explain that. And if you want to come up to me afterwards and talk about it, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. But I can't explain it. But here's my call to you. Are those words too hard? How do I know if God's at work in me? Will you come? Will you come? Will you cross that line of faith? Will you receive the eternal life that only Jesus can give? See, he calls us to examine ourselves. Will you also go away? He calls us to repent. Lord, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Will you believe that this morning? 
And then will you have confidence that He will raise you up the last day? That's our hope. Our hope isn't that somehow I can hold on enough with strong enough faith so that the day of resurrection happens to me on a good day where my faith is strong. And, and boy, I sure hope Jesus doesn't come on a bad day when my faith is weak. No, no, no. Jesus says, I will raise him up. Jesus will take responsibility for you. Come, believe, rest. These are the words of Jesus. Accept them, trust them, believe in him, because where else are you going to get it? Our musicians are going to come. We're going to close this morning. Oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. As we sing this together this morning, this is a prayer of submission. A prayer of, of confidence in turning to God. Would you sing it with me this morning that way? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We believe these words not because they're easy, but because they're yours. We trust in Jesus because he is great. And he is loving and he has given his life for the life of the world. And so may we eat and drink in him. May we have the eternal life that only he can give. May we rest in him confident that he will raise us up at the last day because you are at work in us. This morning there are some who need to cross that line of faith. They need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the sacrifice that can forgive their sins and give them eternal life. Would you draw them to yourself this morning, open their eyes to see the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ, and add them to your family by faith. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.